Hello, my name is Eric Blair, and this is a presentation on molecular quantum dot cellular automata. This is an overview of the concept. I gave this talk recently as a kickoff to a set of research meetings. First, I want to give you a little background on myself. I am a veteran of the U.S. Navy. My education comes from the University of Notre Dame, and I have some teaching experience at the U.S. Naval Academy. I also list here some of the courses I presently teach or plan to teach soon. And as I said, this is the first of several talks for a series of meetings for uh, mainly those people who are interested in doing research with me in our research group. And my hope here is to first give you an overview of the research and then to introduce you to the linear algebra of quantum mechanics as well as programming in MATLAB because that is one of the primary research tools that we use in our group. And I would like to have guest speakers, including yourselves, give research talks on research papers or your work progress and any new ideas that we're investigating. So here's an overview of the couple of presentations I'm going to give. This first part really focuses on the introduction to QCA, and the follow-on part will get a little more into detail about the recent research that I've done in QCA. So first we begin with the motivation for QCA, which really comes from the uh, the end of the transistor scaling roadmap. So for decades we've increased computer performance by shrinking the transistor, and this has happened at, at uh, a pace that's been defined as Moore's Law, where we double the rate, uh, well, we double computing performance every 18 months. And again, shrinking the transistor has enabled this because smaller transistors mean more of them fit onto a square centimeter of silicon, and additionally, we can move smaller amounts of charge around the circuit, and this takes less time, so smaller transistors operate faster. But this scaling and this performance increase has come at a cost. One of the biggest is power dissipation. So a transistor is a current switch, and if current flows through it, it's on. If no current flows through it, it's off. And uh, the power dissipation is heat, and it is quantified by I squared R. That is the current flowing through the transistor, and R, the resistance of the resistor. So if you've taken a circuits class you might recall that the resistance is equal to the resistivity of a resistor or resistance times its length over the area. And as we've shrunk transistors, the uh, length goes down, the area goes down even more. Resistivity is a uh, material parameter, so that doesn't change. The net effect is that resistance goes up, and if resistance goes up, and we can suppose that current's going to stay the same, well, power then must increase. And that's what's driven this curve here. And for the sake of this discussion, we're going to say that 100 watts per square centimeter is the limit of manageable power dissipation. But power dissipation is one of the main trends that has uh, suggested to us that we need a new way to do computing. The other thing is that industry predicts the end of the silicon scaling roadmap within the next decade. That is to say, we will not be able to shrink the, transis the transistor any further in about 10 to 15 years. So, 
quantum dot cellular automata is a solution or a paradigm for computing that's uh, an alternative to the transistor paradigm and the idea here is we can network structures that use charge to represent bits instead of electric current and then we don't need electric current to interconnect the devices so we eliminate the resistive heating and uh, QCA also has a molecular implementation which means very small devices, which means high device densities for increased performance, as well as ultra-high operating speeds, which we will get to in the second part of this talk. And we will see that uh, molecular QCA support very low levels of power dissipation. So here's an overview of how QCA work. The basic computing element in QCA is the QCA cell and here's a simple cell it has four circles representing four quantum dots a quantum dot is a place that localizes mobile charge so if we have two extra electrons occupying these dots they're going to want to occupy antipodal sites and if we allow tunneling between the dots we have device switching between two states. One state is the zero with polarization of minus one, and there's a one bit with polarization of plus one. If we number the dots like this, polarization is this function of mobile charge on the dots. And now we've encoded binary information on the charge configuration of the QCA cell. If we put neighboring cells together, they tend to align like this, so we set the state of cell 1, cell 2 reacts by aligning one way or the other and this cell-cell response function captures that behavior we set the polarization of cell 1 and calculate the response of cell 2 notice that a very weak P1 corresponds to a very strong P2 and this is signal gain we can make some basic QCA devices so in the upper right, we have a binary wire where the input on the left corresponds to the output on the right. The inverter uses a diagonal coupling to invert the bit so that the output is the complement of the input. And the majority gate has three inputs, A, B, and C. They exercise equal influence over the majority gate in the middle and the resulting bit is copied to the output. And here is the truth table for the majority gate in the center. If you notice, any uh, one of the three inputs can function as a control bit. So in this picture, it's A, that's the control bit. And if we set A to 0, then we have AND operation between B and C. And if A is set to 1, then we have OR operation between B and C. And so we get a programmable 2-input AND or OR gate. And these together with the inverter give us a logically complete set by which we can calculate any logic function we desire. Another important feature of QCA is clocking. That is to say we use... Uh, we can control the cell, whether it is active or inactive. And to do that, we add a couple of extra dots to the molecule in the middle here. And here are some leads that indicate we can apply a voltage to those dots to attract the electron to, to those dots or repel the electron from those dots. So with the electrons driven to those dots, we have this new null state which bears no information, it's neither 0 nor 1, nor does it interact with neighboring cells. And then we have the active states as before the 1 and the 0. Here are different ways that QCA cells have been implemented. Here's a metal dot implementation where metal islands provide dots. Uh, these were lithographically defined and uh, they're larger than other implementations, and since Coulomb energies are inversely proportional to uh, 
size or distance. Uh, larger cells mean weaker Coulomb en energies and uh, weaker bit energies, and therefore such, uh, such large cells require low temperatures or cryogenic temperatures of, of operation because um, weak bits can easily get lost in thermal noise. Here is a metal dot QCA majority device that was demonstrated. Here is a clock shift register that was demonstrated in metal dot QCA. Other researchers have built QCA out of semiconductor devices. And here's a fascinating one in which uh, some Canadian researchers learned how to use a scanning tunneling microscope tip to write QCA cells on a silicon surface. Basically, they removed individual atoms from the surface to expose dangling bonds, and those dangling bonds provided quantum dots. I have been most focused and interested in a molecular QCA implementation in which mixed valence compounds provide QCA cells, and in a particular mixed valence molecule, redox centers provide dots. And like the, uh, the, the Canadian implementation, the, uh, the molecules are very small, and so they support room temperature operation. Uh, the devices are synthetically uniform, and uh, they allow ultra-high device densities and rapid device switching speeds. Here is a picture of a very simple toy QCA molecule. It has three allyl groups which provide dots, and here the mobile charge is the absence of an electron or a hole. In the next slide, I provide some pictures of that molecule in three different states. Uh, in the bottom row is the schematic picture, and in the middle row, the red represents the electron, or the electronic wave function in the highest occupied molecular orbital picture, and so the absence of electronic wave function corresponds to the bulge in the isopotential surface diagram up top. So we have three states, the zero, the null, and the one. We would like to uh, plant this molecule on a substrate with the null dot on the bottom. And so then we could apply an electric field which would repel the mobile charge up to the active dot so that the cell takes an active state, or we reverse the polarity and the cell um, goes to the null state. Here's a three-dimensional picture of what that might look like. I take a pair of three-dot cells, and I put them together to form a six-dot cell. And you see the two active states, the zero and the one, and the null state. And we want to set this molecule on the substrate so that the null dots are on the bottom. And Below the molecule, we bury a conductor to which we can apply a negative charge. So in this picture, the, the mobile charge is an electron. And a negative charge on that conductor repels the electrons. The cell goes to an active state, which is determined by interactions with neighbors. If we reverse the polarity of the voltage, well, then we create a positive electric field which attracts the electrons to the null dots. The cell goes to the null state, regardless of what the neighbors are doing. And this can become much more useful if we use arrays of conductors which are independently charged. This leads to an inhomogeneous electric field at the surface, and we get regions of cells which are active. We call those active domains and 
other regions where cells are in the null state, that's a null domain, and calculation is going to take place in between. So I'm going to give you a, a video picture of what that looks like. So first let's focus on the wires. I've color coded them one of four different colors to show that a different voltage of a four phase voltage uh, is applied, a different phase is applied to each color and I note that we're looking down uh, on, on these wires in a plan view and in the next slide we look at the Z component of the electric field that is the electric field that points out of the screen at you and these blue lines mark the position of the wires and the background tells us the electric field where the white regions activate cells, so those are our active domains. The blue regions nullify cells, form your null domains, and, trend, uh, and uh, calculations take place at the leading edge of these active domains as they move in time. And next, to visualize this further, we're going to zoom into the molecular scale because the molecules are much smaller than the wires. That's a good thing. We don't want to connect individual wires to the molecules. So in this picture, I've done some color coding. White squares represent molecules in the null state. Green squares are molecules in the zero state. And red are molecules in the one state. So we're looking at the electric field, which we call the clock. Uh, the clock is pushing bit packets through the wire. And uh, the, a bit pack is, is simply a, a set of contiguous cells that have the same bit. And this wire, since, since its operation is now synchronously controlled by the clock, uh, we refer to it as a shift register. Here is the clock again pushing three bit packets into a majority gate, and you see that in each case the majority wins. And we can put several majority gates together to form an exclusive OR gate. Here I've used fixed cells to program three AND gates, one OR gate, um, and there's also one inverter in the middle. And hierarchical design is demonstrated here as we've gone from majority gate to exclusive OR. We'll take it to another level. We put exclusive OR gates together to form a permuter. This is a planar wire crossing where if a bit comes in red, green uh, on the bottom, it comes out uh, as a green-red on top. Um, so again, let's see, we've got a, there's green-green and then there's green-red coming in and you follow it through, it comes out red-green, top and bottom. And so this demonstrates hierarchical design and computational pipelining where individual calculations sweep through the circuit in series in rapid succession. And that actually brings us to the second part of the talk, but so far we have just looked at the uh, an overview of molecular QCA where I showed you how basic QCA devices work and I showed you how we put them together to make simple circuits and then we put those simpler, simple circuits together to make more complex circuits. And that's the end of this talk. The next one we'll talk about more, uh, we'll focus more on research that I've done recently in QCA. Thank you for your attention.